members of the Johannesburg community, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. My name is uh, Zebron Vilagazi. I am the Deputy Vice Chancellor for Research and Postgraduate Affairs at the University of the Witwatersrand, Johannesburg. I was explaining to the speaker, Ambassador Naj, who I'm going to introduce in a moment, that the Deputy Vice Chancellor sounds like a double negative, right? <laughs> but uh, the Vice Chancellor is the executive head of the university, like the president uh, in US parlance is or director in uh, continental Europe. And uh, for obvious historical reasons of inheritance of traditions that we brought from another, from the Green Island next to France, <laughs> is that the uh, chancellor is a titular head of the university. So I'm the vice president for uh, research and post affairs, under which is the African Center for the Study of the US, which I'll talk about later, I'll mention. I also acknowledge uh, Mr. Mbeki, thank you, sir. Um, one of the progenitors of the center. Uh, actually, it's his brainchild that you have a center, which I talk more, and I can see a director at the back there. I know that uh, this is an academic lecture, so less of bureaucratic <coughs> talk, yours truly, but more to the content. It gives me great pleasure to introduce and invite Ambassador Thibault Naj, the U.S. Assistant Secretary of State for African Affairs, to address us regarding U.S.-Africa relations. It's most opposite that you have this under the auspices, of course, of the support of the U.S. diplomatic mission, and from the academic point of view, the African Center for the Study of the United States, which, as I mentioned earlier, was the brainchild of Mr. Muratin Begi and Mr. and Mr. Mabanja. And we discussed it a few years ago at the University Management. And Professor Tawana Kupe, who is now the uh, Vice Chancellor of the University of Pretoria, was the patron and director of the center and worked tirelessly working in concert with the U.S. Embassy and friends from the Embassy in putting the center together. A pioneering center that obviously helps us to understand the United States from the African point of view, with the reference point being Johannesburg, which is basically the uh, heart of many, is at the center of many of the uh, U.S.S.A. Uh, bilateral operations. And then um, at the end of Previous year, Professor Gilbert Karakaria joined us as a director. Now the center is now safe. Professor Cooper felt that the center is in safe hands, so he could leave it in my hands. So the center is safe. So Ambassador Naj is a retired career foreign service officer, having spent 32 years in government service, including over 20 years in assignments across the entire continent. He served as a U.S. Ambassador to Ethiopia from 1999 to 2002, the Ambassador to Guinea from 1996 to 1999, as well as the Deputy Chief of Mission in Nigeria from 93 to 95. He was also Deputy Chief in Cameroon from 1993, Togo from 87 to 90. This adds on previous assignments, which include Zambia, the Seychelles, Ethiopia, and Washington, D.C. So summing all of the above, <coughs> Ambassador Naj has spent more time of his professional life on the African continent than in his adopted United States or his native country, Hungary. Mm -hmm. Following his, he has received numerous awards from the U.S. State Department in recognition of his service, including commendations for helping prevent famine in, in Ethiopia, supporting the evacuation of Americans from Sierra Leone during the violent insurrection, supporting efforts to end the Ethiopian Eritrean War, and managing the United States Embassy in Lagos 
Nigeria during the political and economic crisis. <coughs> Following his retirement from the Foreign Service, Ambassador Naj served as the Vice Provost for International Affairs at Texas Tech University from 03 to 2018. So he knows the academic space very well. During that time, he lectured nationally <coughs> on Africa, foreign policy, international development, and U.S. diplomacy. In addition to serving as a regular op-ed contributor to Lubo Avalanche Journal newspaper on global events, he also co-authored Kiss Your Latte Goodbye, Managing Overseas Operations, an unfiction winner of the 2014 Paris Book Festival. Ambassador Naj arrived in the United States in 1957 as a political refugee from Hungary. He received his BA from Texas Tech University and MSA from George Washington University. He has been married to Eva Jane Naj for 47 years. And now this is very interesting. <laughs> Naj has three adult children. The first triplets were born in independent Zimbabwe. So, <laughs> we are fellow African. So, Ambassador Naj, ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to welcome on stage uh, Ambassador Naj to say a few words. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. Hi. Good one. We're in Africa, not Europe, we're in the United States. Uh, it's wonderful to be back in an academic setting. Uh, I feel very much at home, both in Africa and in academia. Uh, so I will give my prepared remarks as quickly as possible so we can get to the fun part, which is the, the back and forth, the question and answers. Thank you very much, Deputy Vice Chancellor of Ilakazi, for the introduction. I'm grateful to you and to everyone at Wits University and the African Center for the study of the United States for hosting today's event. And thanks to all of you here today for this welcome to South Africa. I know many of you are still reflecting on yesterday's State of the Nation address and that the rest are probably thinking about how today is the last day of exams. <laughs> Having served in both government and academia, I can sympathize with you all. So thank you again for coming today. I'm thrilled to be here. As uh, His Excellency said, I spent most of my 32-year career as an American diplomat on this continent, and I was fortunate to serve in Ethiopia, Guinea, Nigeria, Cameroon, Togo, Zambia, and the Seychelles, and in Zimbabwe. The world, including Africa, has changed dramatically from when I became a diplomat in 1978. When I first set foot on the continent, there were no cell phones, no internet, few television stations, and to call back to America from Lusaka required booking a slot days ahead to reserve one of the few international lines available at the time, if it worked. Today, modern technology has changed all that. Mobile messenger apps effortlessly connect people in Africa and around the world, and last year, when my grandson was born right here in South Africa, so far from home, I was incredibly grateful for the gift of real-time communication. Since I assumed my current role last September, this is my fourth trip to Africa. These trips provide me the opportunity to meet with government officials, business leaders, civil society, and Africa's dynamic youth to hear a range of views and discuss concrete ways to strengthen cooperation. So today, I am truly excited to speak to you about the enduring relationship between the United States and the countries of Africa, most especially South Africa. Specifically, I want to talk about the U.S. government's policy priorities in Africa and how we are working with partners like South Africa to achieve our common goals. Our engagement in Africa is driven largely by four guiding principles. First. The United States is interested in promoting stronger trade and business ties between Africa and America to the benefit of the people of both. Second, we must harness the potential of Africa's tremendous youth population to drive Africa's economic growth 
and create real prosperity. And I call that the youth tsunami, which is getting ready to wash over Africa between now and 2050. Third, we must continue to advance peace and security across the continent. Fourth, I am here today to reinforce that America has an unwavering commitment to Africa. No country in the world can match the depth and breadth of America's long engagement with the people of Africa. The United States greatly values its partnership with South Africa as the democratic and economic leader on the world's fastest growing continent. Nevertheless, we all know South Africa faces some tough choices as it seeks to increase economic growth and come to grips with how best to manage and reform struggling state-owned enterprises. I would be remiss to play down the challenges you face. At the same time, we do not view these challenges as obstacles, but as an opportunity for closer cooperation. Quite the opposite. The United States is South Africa's third largest trading partner, with two-way trade in 2018 at $13.7 billion, and we'd like to be number one. Our imports from South Africa include everything from precious metals, iron, steel and aluminum, automobiles, auto parts, millions of cartons of citrus and table grapes from the northern and western Cape. We have been the largest source of foreign direct investment here for much of the last 15 years. Over 500 American companies are active in South Africa, accounting for an estimated 10% of GDP and over 200,000 jobs. The hallmark of American companies is that they are employing South Africans for good jobs, transferring skills, and developing talent, all the while improving the competitiveness of South Africa in the global economy. This U.S. interest in deepening trade and investment ties with South Africa extends throughout the region, as well as the continent. With the strong backing of the Trump administration, our Congress recently, built, uh, pa recently passed legislation called the BUILD Act. This law doubles the U.S. government's investment capital from $29 billion to $60 billion and offers promising opportunities for more U.S. direct investment in Africa. This new legislation will enable the U.S. government to make equity investments in African companies, and we hope to use these resources to unlock billions in private capital from the United States. Our government also recently unveiled the Prosper Africa Initiative. That's where I've been the last few days in Maputo talking about that. Prosper Africa is an ambitious effort to significantly increase two-way trade in goods and investment between America and Africa. Prosper Africa will help us expand the number of commercial deals between U.S. and African counterparts and promote better business climates and financial markets on the continent. U.S. companies investing in President Ramaphosa's goal of raising 100 billion U.S. dollars in new investments over five years. At last October's investment conference in Johannesburg, U.S. companies including McDonald's, Procter & Gamble announced large new investments. Microsoft announced it would build three data centers and Amazon <coughs> unveiled plans for a cloud computing hub. Most recently, United Airlines announced a new nonstop flight to Cape Town from the United States, complementing flights by Delta Airlines to Johannesburg. Regionally, we are similarly excited to see U.S. energy companies interested in investment opportunities in Namibia, production facilities in Iswatini, and agriculture in Angola. This is what U.S. commercial engagement in Africa looks like. Our second priority, is harnessing the potential of Africa's youth population. We have seen time and again that investing in education is the best way to invest in the future. I saw this firsthand as Vice Provost for International Affairs at Texas Tech University. Africa's population is projected to double by 2050 to around 2.5 <coughs> billion people, of which over 60% will be under the age of 25. We must find ways to ensure the youth have the education and training that leads to enhanced employment opportunities. It means jobs, jobs, and jobs. Right here at Wits University, we have a great example of the U.S.-South African Education Partnership in the IBM Research Lab. Just this year, 
U.S. Department of State Deputy Secretary Sullivan visited this lab and was impressed with its capabilities and the potential for private-public partnerships to help solve pressing challenges in South Africa. The Department of State has many programs to promote membership, mentorship, networking, and career development for young people. This includes, of course, the Young African Leaders Initiative, or what we call the Mandela Washington Fellowship. This year, 700 young African leaders from all across Sub-Saharan Africa were selected to participate in the program. They are in the United States at this very moment for training and academic coursework, networking, and mentoring at 27 top U.S. universities, including mine, Texas Tech. When they return home, they will join approximately 3,700 fellowship alumni, including 258 South Africans, to tackle key issues their countries face today. In South Africa, alumni of U.S. government exchange programs have made great strides in a variety of important areas. For example, Murundeni Mafumo became a Mandela Washington Fellow in 2014 as a scientist working in water purification and attended a program at Yale University. Three years ago, he launched a social enterprise, Kusini Water, with a locally designed water purification system. The system uses an activated carbon filter made from macadamia nutshells. For every liter of water his company sells, they provide 20 liters of safe drinking water to communities that do not have access to clean water. Murundeni is using his innovative work to bring systematic change in underserved communities. He attended the Global Entrepreneurship Summit earlier this month to share his expertise with the international business community. Tsiki Biela, an alumna of our African Women's Entrepreneurship Program, broke <coughs> new ground as the country's first female black winemaker. Her incredible story from domestic worker to winemaker is even more impressive considering the marketing in inroads she has made both here and abroad, including in the United States. But an educated and innovative population is only possible with our third priority, advancing peace and stability. The United States will continue to help our African allies build secure and resilient communities bolstered by capable and accountable security and defense institutions. These institutions should help to foster an environment in which businesses can flourish and the aspirations of young Africans can be met. We support South Africa's contributions to peace and security in Africa. Of note, with over 1,000 100 peacekeepers serving in the Democratic Republic of the Congo and elsewhere, South Africa ranks in the top 20 of force contributors to UN missions. We greatly appreciate South Africa's contributions and the participation of forces from other SADC countries, including Zambia and Malawi. We would like to see our long-standing partnership with South Africa extend to other fora especially multilateral bodies. South Africa currently plays an important role as a member of the United Nations Security Council and a leader in the African Union. We were also very pleased to see the positive role SADC, Southern African Development Community, played when Lesotho faced the security crisis. SADC sent civilian and security reinforcements to support a neighbor in a time of need. This is exactly the role we would like to see regional organizations play across all of Africa. Finally, our fourth priority, our unwavering support of Africa, <clears throat> brings us full circle. The United States offers a different model of engagement in Africa that is based on mutual respect, collaboration, sustainability, and transparency. We don't simply invest in Africa, we invest in African people. We have walked side by side with Africans for decades. How so? Through our programs like Power Africa, Peace Corps, President's Malaria Initiative, and our signature HIV AIDS program, U.S. President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief, or PEPFAR. These programs have provided electricity to towns and villages, 
They have brought enthusiastic American volunteers to rural areas across Africa, focused on community-led health and education projects. They have also saved lives that could have been lost to malaria and HIV AIDS. Since 2004, PEPFAR has invested over $6 billion in HIV programs here, partnering with hundreds of South African organizations, including right here at WITS and the government of South Africa. In the region, PEPFAR represents a significant part of our foreign assistance. We are tremendously excited, therefore, that a number of countries in the region are on track to soon reach epidemic control. Through PEPFAR and our National Institutes of Health, the United States supports pioneering biomedical research, including HIV vaccine trials. Every day, American and South African scientists Researchers and public health experts are working together to enhance HIV prevention and care and develop innovative approaches to HIV antiretroviral therapy service delivery. There is no better way to demonstrate the U.S. commitment to Africa than through our investment in its most important resource, its people. There is a Swahili proverb that says, unity is strength, division is weakness. That is true within a country, and it is true between countries. As I said at the top of my remarks, I am visiting here to listen, learn, and to find new areas of cooperation. On this latter point, I also come to reaffirm the United States' unwavering commitment to Africa and to South Africa. We have and will continue to invest in people and build partnerships that promote better health, jobs, skills, education, opportunity, and security. This is an exciting time to be in Africa. The dynamism of Africa's youth is apparent everywhere you look. And if governments, businesses, and educational institutions unite in nurturing this next generation, Africa's future will be secured. Africa is the dynamic continent of the future. And South Africa has proven itself a leader for other African nations to follow. Unity is strength. Division is weakness. Let us take this proverb to heart, continue to work together with common vision and purpose to promote shared American and African prosperity and security. God bless you all. Thank you very much.
uh, from the alumni and so on and so forth. So we'll try to do it that way. And we'll never take two questions at one go, just yeah. one question, and then uh, uh, Assistant Secretary Nice will respond to that. Is that, that okay? Yeah, and I'm glad you said that. Uh, please, you know, no, I, I'm an academician, so I am no more than one part questions. I'm 70 years old. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, I will start. Yes, the back there. Please, uh, what sector do you represent so that I can actually do the clustering as I mentioned? Me? Thank you, um, Shannon Ibrahim, the group foreign editor for independent media in South Africa. Um, Ambassador Nej, I wanted to ask you about your trip to Sudan and your meeting with the head of the Transitional Military Council. Um, what was your impressions? Do you think that there will be a smooth transition to democracy? What would be the timeline that you would expect would be followed? Um, and in, in the near term, do you think that the U.S. can put any significant pressure to move this process along so that there's a transition to civilian rule? So, so that's, that's all for one part of questions. Yeah. <laughs> but, but I'm actually I'm very glad you asked that one because um, I had not planned to go to Sudan. I had, uh, I had to drop three co uh, countries off my planned trip uh, where I very much wanted to go, Zambia, Zimbabwe, and Angola because of what happened on June the 3rd the horrible violence that took part in Khartoum. Um, I, we met, of course, we met with the Transitional Military Council, we met with the uh, Forces for Change, we met with NGOs, we met with, with so many different people. And unfortunately, what started out as a popular, um, I don't want to use the word rebellion because that doesn't actually characterize what happened, but it was a, just a popular outpouring movement based on the people and, at the time, on the military, uh, the two sides were together. If people remember, initially, uh, the military put in their council some people that the FFC was not happy with, and the military changed it. Early on, they actually worked as partners. Unfortunately, as time moved forward, uh, they came close three times, very, very close to having an agreement. And unfortunately, spoilers from one side or the other ended those efforts. At this stage, the two sides absolutely do not trust each other. Um, so that's why it's very important to work through mediators. It would be very difficult for them to now agree, come to an agreement uh, working directly with each other. Absolutely there is a uh, opportunity for a peaceful outcome. The entire international community is united in the goal, you know, the, the final goal. Every, everybody wants to see a civilian-led government in Sudan that meets the aspirations of the Sudanese people. Um, nobody wants to see other two possible scenarios, which would be a disaster for the region. One would be a state collapse along the lines of Somalia. Ethiopia does not need another Somalia on its western border, and Egypt certainly does not need another what would be a Libya on its southern border. Um, so, so that outcome nobody wants. Another negative outcome would be the return of the old regime sneaking back in, you know, over time. So it's essential for them to come to an agreement. There are some very highly talented mediators involved. The United States of America is playing absolutely a supportive role. We totally support the African Union process. We support uh, EGAD, uh, Intergovernmental uh, Organization Development. The regional body, Prime Minister Abi of Ethiopia is the chair of that. So there is a very talented Ethiopian mediator as well. Um, we, we will support any way we can, as will any number of other friends of Sudan, because everybody wants that outcome. We've had such good news in Africa these last couple of years. Uh, we had wonderful developments in the Horn of Af Africa uh, with Ethiopia, Prime Minister Abi. <clears throat> Angola has made, been making very positive moves forward. Even last year's elections in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, for the first time in its history, the DRC may actually be democratic and a republic, which would be a wonderful advance. So there are good news, and, and it would be wonderful for the continent if one more huge area turned from an area of instability to an area of stability. So we're all keeping our fingers crossed. We're all being very supportive. But there's definitely danger of uh, negative outcomes. Thank you. Uh, 
gentleman at the back, there with the hat. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Jeff Hill, the Washington Times. Uh, when Walter Kenstein had your job, he spoke very passionately about um, America possibly recognizing the, the breakaway republic of Somalia. And you've talked to about Somalia and the Horn of Africa. Can you tell us something about your relations with Hargisa, which works as a, many of us have been there, works as a de facto independent state, but with no recognition. Could you tell us something about how you relate to Somalia? Yeah, absolutely. And by the way, I just saw Walter Gansteiner in Maputo yesterday and the day before. And I said, Walt, do you want your old job back? <laughs> you know, the chair is there waiting for you. Uh, now, um, actually, I, I love your question because when I was ambassador to Ethiopia, I had very uh, cordial relations with Somaliland's first president, President Igal. And he was so frustrated by the international community's lack of, of uh, you know, formal relations. Here's a deal with, uh, with Somaliland. The United States recognizes the integrity of Somalia uh, in supporting the view of the African Union. Uh, you know, if, if there are changes in the future, we will, of course, evaluate those changes. Our we now have a, an ambassador resident in Somalia, in Mogadishu, Ambassador Don Yamamoto, Brilliant uh, diplomat, one of our most senior ambassadors. And in the course of his engagement with Somalia, he also makes trips from time to time to Hargeisa. Uh, it is within the purview of his discussion with the Somalia government. When he does that, he does it with the understanding of the, the government of Somalia. But Somaliland, it, it is not legally recognized as a country. <laughs> But it is a functioning part of Somalia, so obviously we have to have interactions with them within that context. Uh, you know, we will see what the future holds. Ambassador, that's a very diplomatic answer. So, I will move to a more academic question. I want to just ensure that you cover the broad needs of both the media, the students, and the academy, the community in general. I take an, are you an academic, sir? Okay. Dr. Gerald Levin, alumni from PIPFA Fellow 2010. And my question closer to home is that in South Africa, a study released this week, youth unemployment in South Africa after two years with training is 78%. And without training, it's 89%. And as, a, as an academic, the question is, can you put in place some structures where South Africa can learn from the USA the uh, fundamentals of bringing jobs back into the country and uh, preserving the uh, job situation and growing the economy? We've lost a tremendous amount of jobs to foreign countries because costs are lower there. <coughs> we have to also bring them back, as the USA is uh, successfully doing now with excellent management skills. So can you kindly comment if you can assist us to put in place some structures to model the USA strategies at present? Thank you. Yeah, um, great question. Here's the situation. South Africa, unfortunately, has gone back quite a bit over the last nine years. Part of it, obviously, I, it's, it's no secret here, part of it started with the global recession, but part of it was definitely uh, politically induced. But at the same time, South Africa starts with so many advantages that so many other countries on this continent do not share. Um, phenomenal level of, of infrastructure, very, very highly educated population, institutions in place which work well. So many countries are personality based. South Africa was one of the, the post colonial African countries that was institution based. Uh, excellent university system uh, that rival higher you know, education institutions anywhere. Wonderful to hear that. So those, those treasures exist. They just now have to be re-exploited and re-engaged. Um, the su success, of course, comes through jobs. Because that's what all the young people want. I, I, I've made this in so many speeches that there is no difference now in young people in Africa, young people anywhere else, 
because they all get on the internet, and the young people in Africa see exactly how the young people in Europe or America live, and they, as well as they should, they want exactly the same things. A nice house, be able to supply for their family, you know, a car, th that lifestyle, which, which everybody aspires to. And, and that comes through jobs. And who creates jobs? Okay, I, this may be a philosophical difference, uh, you know, with, with fellow academicians. <laughs> From my experience and from my studies, jobs are created by the private sector. The government and the public sector are wonderful at spending, but at creating actual wealth, it's the private sector. Then it's the government's responsibility. Uh, who creates, you know, in the private sector is done through foreign direct investment. If we look at the Chinese development model, we, I think we all, all agree that China did a phenomenal job of economic development. On the economic side, at least, I'm not talking about the political side, because we have differences of opinion on the political side. But on the economic side, China did not even have a development agency. It was all done through foreign direct investment. Boom, it was an explosion. So what African countries need more than anything else is foreign direct investment. I cannot do what my counterparts do in the Far East. I cannot order American companies I can't say, U.S. Steel, go to the Gambia and set up a steel plant. I can't do that. I can encourage American companies to go to places. And here's the truth. American companies are sitting on billions and billions and billions of dollars that they're looking to invest. Because the American economy has been wonderful the last decade or plus. You know, it, it, we have, what, 3.2% unemployment which is beyond full employment. Companies are making incredible profits. So that they have all this money they're looking to use, but they're only going to go where they feel like there's a welcoming environment. So that's the second part of it. And, and I'm working on this systematically with our embassies. We will engage with countries in Africa to talk to them seriously about what American businesses look for in a welcoming environment. Number one, a level playing field where they have the same chance as companies from other places. Number two, the sanctity of contracts. If they sign a contract, it's not going to be broken just like that. Low levels of corruption. I cannot say no corruption because there is no country with no corruption. But low levels of corruption. A fair dispute resolution mechanism. So if there's a dispute with that company, with somebody else, the judge will not automatically decide in favor of the president's nephew or whoever pays the largest bribe. Also, under that, we also have things like good governance, uh, open political space, rights of women and other minorities, because American companies care about good citizenship. Uh, you know, okay, I'm American, so I'm, I'm, I'm not objective. But I really do think that American companies are the best corporate citizens. They care about the environment. They will not smuggle out ivory. Uh, you know, they will not mess up the environment, uh, and they will treat their workers fairly. But, but that's how you create jobs, and you can do it relatively quickly. Uh, as I said, we should take advantage of this moment of world history when companies have so much excess capital to invest. And I would love for them to come to South Africa. I, 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 well, that's one of the reasons I came here. I wanted to listen and look so I can go back and tell American companies, yes, you know, go to South Africa. There are millions of young people looking for jobs. They're going to be excellent employees, so go. That's the best I can do. Okay, I'll, I'll now take a question from the, uh, this discussion here. Uh, the central theme of the ambassador's presentation was the African youth potential. And uh, that young lady, there, hand. You here? Glasses, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, my name is Samantha Nolomba, and I suppose I'm speaking for the alumni um, as part of the IVLP uh, last year. And it was an amazing experience. Uh, however, I think there's also missed opportunity with certain programs such as the IVLP. My question is, to what extent in the planning of programs such as those, does the, I'll, I suppose I'll use the US Embassy, to what extent are they open to actual engagement with the participants or other stakeholders within the countries that represent the participants? 
Because, for instance, while we were there, there was a lot of emphasis on what the United States is doing in Africa, um, the history of the U.S., which was very informative, but wasn't necessarily practically applicable to us when we returned to our different countries. There was an understanding, per se, of um, the participants' work, what the issues are in the countries that they represent. So some examples or practical expectations of the work that we do when we return is not practical at all. So to what extent, or currently, is there engagement with the representatives of the participants to make it a more holistic approach? Thank, thank you very much for that question, because that, that for me is extremely valuable experience. Ideally, we have close consul consultation at the beginning of the program between the embassy and Washington in all of these exchange programs, and the embassy should, we, you know, look, I, I mean, I know they do, is they engage on this <coughs> to talk to, to the local folks as to what should the program components. Then sometimes it's a negotiation between Washington and the embassy. Invariably, the embassy has full local understanding and local knowledge. The people in Washington sometimes do not, and the program ends up not being as, su you know, as successful or, or, or as sharp as we would want it to be. And so the second part of that is when people return from a program, we usually will get in touch with them and talk to them to see, okay, how was your experience? You know, what did you gain? What was done well? What could have been done better? And as the program goes on, multi-year programs, they get better and more relevant with each year. That has certainly ha happened with YALI, Mandela Fellows, which for me is like our, our diamond program of all uh, with Africa. And uh, it, it's just incredible, you know, how well that works on both sides. And then even how incredibly successful some of those people have been once they have come back to Africa. So I, I appreciate your comments very much. I encourage you to get in touch with the uh, public diplomacy section. Of, or, do you live in Johannesburg? Or, I do, yeah. Yeah, with our consulate in Johannesburg. Share your experience so that, the, that they can interact with the Washington office to make the program more enriching. Because the program's for you. You know, we, we, we want you guys to benefit from it at the end of the day. But on the Washington end, very often, there's not the full cultural understanding of, of what we're dealing with. So thank you very much. OK, uh, we only have time for one question. And I'll take one from the media, Mr. Bauer. <laughs> oh, you can hold this. <laughs> Uh, good afternoon. If you are brief, I can, you can give others a chance. I, I'll be definitely brief. Um, I understand that you're a diplomat, Assistant Secretary. Sorry, Nicholas Bayer, a journalist here in Johannesburg. Um, and I understand that the US, you're trying to encourage US companies to invest in Africa, but let's also face facts. Uh, the Trump administration has embraced tariffs, trade wars, protectionism, multilateralism is not on the radar, I would see. And I understand we're not as close to home as Mexico, we're not as threatening as China. But in plain language, what does this mean for trade with Africa and America? Uh, what does it mean for AGOA? Yeah, okay, AGOA, as we all know, is safe for six years. That has been recently extended. Um, AGOA has been incredibly successful. Some countries have taken better advantages of it than other countries. Uh, we still have six years, so we would encourage those countries that have not yet taken advantage of it to do so. For Africa, and I can only speak about Africa because that is my beat and that's my responsibility, I've been delighted with the programs that have come out. I mean, when I came into this job, I came into this job specifically to help with getting jobs for the young Africans. Because I, I look to that as one of the major, will be, and I, I promise you historians will say, it was one of the major factors and movements of the 21st century, the doubling of the African population and the introduction of millions and millions and millions of young Africans facing two roads. And, and, and we're, we're at the crossroads right now. One way will lead incredible prosperity, dynamism, economic activity, Africa finally joining the global system, you know, economically and technologically. That can come through the force of these young people who also, of course, will be millions and millions of consumers for those of us who want to sell them things. But the other road is extremely troubling 
because if these young people do not have opportunities, if they do not have jobs, if they get frustrated, we know uh, what grows those frustrations are going to lead to. It's going to be instability, political chaos in certain places, millions and millions of, of young Africans heading towards Europe as migrants, which is a whole other issue, and then the uh, increasing vulnerability to radical movements, including violent extremism. So, so the job factor is absolutely essential. I came into the job with that focus. Uh, the Trump administration's Africa policy out in October of last year focused on this very same issue. And then what we just announced in Maputo, Prosper Africa, which is finally focusing the entire U.S. government effort that is involved in Africa on this very issue. Because that has been one of my frustrations. As I said in my remark, my public remarks in Maputo, this should have come 20 years ago. And because for decades, American diplomats have visited ministers of trade and industry in African capital, and you know, we pound on the table and say, what your country needs is a one-stop shop for, for US business, or any business, one-stop shop. Do a one-stop, well, they've done a one-stop shop, but you know who never did a one-stop shop? Washington. So finally, we're putting in a one-stop shop. You know, okay, finally, 20 years too late, but I'm glad we're finally doing it. So we are focusing US government efforts, all of them, together on, on supporting trade between the U.S. and Africa. And it's high time we did so, because, you know, we, we have been behind in certain areas. We need to catch up. And, and again, I have a passion in my heart for the young people of Africa. I want every single one of them to have a good job. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We have one last question. In fact, from the youth, because this conversation was about youth, and most of our young people are women, so we take this young lady there. Introduce yourself, please, very close. Hi everyone, my name is Vanessa Rilechi Chandu and I'm representing the World Economic Forum Global Shapers. Um, I wanted to ask about the, especially speaking about trade, African free trade movement. I mean, the free trade movement. The free trade movement. The continental wide free trade agreement of the African Union. Yes, absolutely. Okay. So I want to obviously. Um, Perhaps if you could share your reflections on where you think the U.S. stands on that, especially with uh, the trade opportunities opening up across the continent sure. and it being a top of mind of many um, African countries. Sure, thank you very much. That's another one of my favorite issues. <clears throat> another goal I had coming into this job is that before I leave, I would very much like the United States of America to have a free trade, a bilateral free trade agreement with an African country. We did not move on that immediately because we were, we did not want to be seen as competing with the continent-wide free trade agreement. We wanted to work parallel to that. So now that everything has been signed, the uh, CFTA has been formally implemented, now we want to get energized. And we have a number of African countries who have said, you know, we, we're ready to talk on this. Because right now, I'm embarrassed to say the United States of America only has one free trade agreement with an African country. Just one. And that's with Morocco. So I am passionate about having one with a sub-Saharan African country. Uh, you know, we, uh, as I said, we have a number of candidates. Now we have to talk to them and, and see which one we can do. That one, hopefully, we would use as a model with other countries. Because we, we do, we want to evolve the trade partnership beyond just the AGOA to something that's more sophisticated as African markets become more sophisticated and economies change towards services. Uh, you know, for example, one of, one of my big areas is educational exchanges because I truly believe that African universities and American universities can truly benefit each other. Obviously, we learn as much from our African partners as, as vice versa but the opportunities for student exchanges, for faculty exchanges, for joint research projects, and even for, uh, for dual degrees, where an African student can attend both universities, part, you know, two years, two years, and end up with degrees from both universities. So, so those are now sophisticated types of exchanges which need other mechanisms. Thank you very much. Um, I'm looking at the clock. Uh, the timekeeper gave me until 20 past. If you know the language of football, I mean, real football. 